Brandis, in less than an hour, President Joe Biden will address a joint session of Congress to mark 100 days since taking office and to pitch some of his sweeping legislative proposals. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki gave a preview of what Biden might say to the pared down and masked audience. Well, the major policy announcement in the speech is, of course, the American Families Plan, a historic investment in education and child care. He will also use the speech as an opportunity to talk about many of his other priorities, including police reform, immigration, gun safety, his ongoing work to get the pandemic under control, and to putting Americans back to work. And joining us now are Mari Masing Will, principal of Masing Communications and a political advisor and speechwriter for numerous Republican politicians, and Jason DeSanto, senior lecturer at Northwestern University's Pritzker School of Law and a speechwriter and debate advisor for many Democratic politicians. Great to have both of you back here. Uh, Jason, I want to talk about the optics here. A speech in front of a sparsely populated room, socially distant, wearing masks, many Republicans saying they will not be in attendance, and a Capitol still reeling from what happened there on January 6th. How does all of this play in to what viewers will see on TV tonight? Well, they're going to see a very different spectacle, and it usually is a spectacle, a joint session. We think about these as State of the Union addresses typically, but the joint session speech has taken on kind of this first year of the presidency motif where it, it acts like a State of the Union address, but it's not really called one. And usually we're thinking about 1,600 people that are present for that. This time they're going to be about 200. The dynamics are going to be different. People are going to be spread out. The room is going to be emptier. Just from an auditory perspective, that's going to be a little bit different for Joe Biden. And in terms of what we're going to see at home, in terms of the shots that we're going to see, of reactions. But ultimately, the name of the game here is the ability to, at one moment in time, talk about the past, the present, and chart a course for the future. That's what these speeches do. That's still the goal, and that's what Joe Biden's going to try to do tonight. Uh, Mari Masing, Will, you heard Jen Psaki talk about uh, this $1.8 trillion investment uh, called the American Families Plan, uh, funding things like universal preschool, health care, free community college. Would you expect here a policy-laden speech? That's unfortunately what it, it usually turns out to be. These speeches are easy to give because you have a teleprompter, but a nightmare to write and very often hard to endure. It's a challenge for the speechwriter to try to keep it a coherent whole because you just heard the laundry list of things that Jen said that they were going to try to include. The speechwriter basically battles against everybody who has an idea in the West Wing and the cabinet agencies uh, for, to include in there. I, I am hoping, however, that um, that it won't be as much that as it will be uh, the president seizing this optimistic moment in America, where I think most people are feeling good right now. Everyone who can wants to be vaccinated can be. People are feeling free. They can hug each other again. They're going back to work, and there's and it's springtime, and and I think that if he were to bond with that moment and give an aspirational speech rather than a detailed policy speech, you have to go through some of it and check the boxes. But if it were, was about the America that he wanted to see again and, and even a better America than we've ever had before, that would be a moment that I think would help his personal popularity and his personal. So, so a hope springs eternal peace. Jason DeSanto, one of the things the president did want to see was bipartisanship in the country. He's, he's, he's tried to walk that line, although Republicans say bipartisanship is nowhere to be found. Do you think he will try to persuade the country, persuade Republicans that we are entering a bipartisan moment? I think he's going to try to persuade Americans that he's acting in a way where he's listening and where he has an arm outstretched. I do think rhetorically what he's probably going to have to do is demonstrate two things. First of all, that his proposals are a matter of common sense and are in step with the American people and particularly with the middle class. So that's a challenge rhetorically. And at the same time, demonstrate that Republicans who are in Congress are acting in a way which is more ideological and which is not really ready to find common ground. And in that way, what he's going to have to do, Paris, really is try to separate, as he's tried to do in some other appearances, Republican leadership, Republican representatives and senators from Republicans in the country and make the argument that his, his plans are popular, that he has 69 percent approval ratings on handling the pandemic. He won't 
cite that number specifically, but he knows that. And he also knows he has a majority of Americans who are in favor broadly of his economic stewardship. I think what he's going to try to demonstrate is what he is advocating is in step with people, not with the Republicans themselves. And that's a debate they're going to be having over the next few weeks when he's done tonight. And Mari Mossing, well, you've heard Republicans not so much seize on all this big spending that the government is undertaking, but focusing more on things like the border, culture war issues, Dr. Seuss. We're going to have uh, South Carolina Senator Tim Scott give the rebuttal. Is that the kind of thing you would expect in that speech? Oh, no. Tim Scott is uh, one of the most liked senators uh, in that chamber. He's uh, very smart. Uh, but he's also affable, and he is interested in bipartisan, working in a bipartisan way. Um, he had introduced previously, for example, um, justice reform, and he's very interested in that. I actually think, I, I d disagree just a little bit with Jason here, I don't think the president should attack the, uh, the Republican members of Congress. If, if I were him, I would not attack anybody. I would try to, t I would just talk about what I wanted to achieve. And I think there's a big intersection in the Venn diagram between Republicans and uh, Democrats in some of these core issues like police reform, justice reform, immigration reform. And uh, he's got a little bit of a free pass on his economic proposal since the Republicans spent like crazy during the last administration. So they're trying to get their theory of governance back together. But I think, I, I was very encouraged to hear this afternoon that he might think about breaking apart immigration uh, reform into smaller pieces, because I think um, uh, making uh, the uh, children who came here, uh, uh, not according to their own will, the DACA, young people, make, make, uh, enabling them to become Americans right away. I, I, I think that there is a, that's an 80% issue in the United States. If you could take things like that piece by piece, the rest of it will have to be negotiated. But I think most Americans want eventually there to be a pathway for citizenship. And I think it would be good for the Republican Party to compromise on some of these issues. I think it's out there. I think that's what Tim Scott will try to talk about. Uh, at least I hope it is. I hope that he will also pre present uh, a more harmonious, optimistic possibility for America. All right. Always great insights from both of you, but we are out of time. Our thanks to Mari Massingwill and Jason DeSanto.